Hi, and welcome to Women of Worth Wednesday. I am so excited about this opportunity today, this conversation we're having. Thank you, High Five Live, for allowing us to have this weekly show and to connect with viewers all over the world. Um, if you will put down in the comments where you are watching from, uh, we would love to see where our brothers and sisters are from all over the world today during this Women of Worth Wednesday. I feel so grateful today to be with world-renowned, celebrated artist, Liz Lemon Swindle. That's and nice. we are here in her beautiful studio, and I just feel like this is one of those moments, pinch me moments for me. Um, gosh, I already feel emotional. <laughs> um, I've heard from so many of you as we've built up this um, this interview today about how her work has blessed your life and sorry I don't I it's always okay to cry on women of worth but I didn't expect to feel this emotional already <laughs> um, I feel so blessed that we have this opportunity to talk with Liz and and maybe have an understanding of the process that she goes through her history but also her <clears throat> feelings and the conversations that we have every week here on Women of Worth um, and on High Five Live reach all over the world and have created such um, healing and blessings for our viewers that I feel uh, a profound sense of excitement for today because I know there's going to be something said in this conversation that will bless you in some way and allow you to share um, around the world um, with people that you love um, this conversation and maybe they're artists and maybe they're not maybe they're just moms so before we dive into some of um, the deeper questions I wanted to kind of just get a background from Liz on the timeline of her life and when art really became more than just maybe a passing hobby okay let's see um I honestly don't remember a time in my life where I wasn't drawing it was even from a little tiny girl, my parents, my first grade teacher actually, had brought my parents in and said that I was being quite destructive with school property and that I was writing on desk and drawing on desk and books and things that were totally inappropriate and wanted me to channel that right. energy somewhere else. And so my father, um, he became my first art teacher, even though he doesn't, he doesn't know anything about art other than he appreciates it. But every Sunday afternoon, he'd sit down with me and we'd kind of sketch together. That was kind of fun, but especially because I already loved it. And then he would find other artists in the community that I started taking formal lessons. And then that tutelage just continued through my life. So, so I love that, just that glimpse into what a parent can do to nurture yeah. a talent. Instead of getting frustrated when a child may be acting out, how can we support our kids and kind of their mission on earth and what they're coming to earth to do? And your dad yeah. seemed to protect that. Well, he could have gone a different way than what he did. Right. He could have gone with more of the discipline type of uh, reaction to it of, no, you can't do this. Don't do that. Rather yeah. than that, he really, he did provide a lot of opportunities where I was exposed to the arts because I grew up in Perry, Utah, yes. and, and really it's a little tiny kind of bedroom community. To, and so it wasn't, the you opportunities access, weren't there. Right. You, know? you would have to go to Salt Lake, and even then, at that time, the arts were really just sort of taking root. Grass, and, grass. and visually, um, my father wasn't well familiar enough with it to take me to the places in Salt Lake. So he just sort of took this upon himself. So he would get books and he'd read about it and about artists. And oh, I love that. He was such a wonderful, and my mother too, but my father was really more of actively involved in it. And so, and he was also really wonderful when I would present him with my offerings. He would of celebrate sketches. it. He, he would just make such a huge deal out of how great they were and how wonderful. And, and then he put it on the refrigerator, and that was sort of like a gallery for us. So I love that. I love that. So all those kids' drawings that we put on the refrigerator were, were encouraging our kids to know that we, we believe in their path. So from there, did you do some formal training? Were you taking I did. in I, um, Yes. I went to Weber State and Utah State, and I was there 
I, I had to fit classes in because I was raising kids. Yeah. So, so my you were husband, already married, and how many kids did and you have? So I had all of my children before I was 30. So, so tell everyone how many that is. I had five children. Five children. Mm -hmm. And back in college. I love it. It was it was hard, hard. because I, I had a friend. We were at Utah State. I had a friend, and she would... I would, uh, she would watch my children in the morning and I would take classes and then we traded and I would watch hers in the afternoon so she could go. So we were able to, so I had some really great opportunities as far as schooling and then I had, but even more than that, just the private tutors were the ones that really were the one-on-one -on -one is the one where I really was able to kind of shine. And you studied um, under? Nancy Glazier, Kohler. Uh, I think she just goes by Nancy Glazier now. And she made a huge difference in just the path I took. But she was she specializes more in landscape. Is that she's true? a wildlife artist. Wildlife actually. artist. Buffalo, I think, are primarily her thing. But, but she gave you even more wind beneath your wings. She did, and almost reluctantly, because this is kind of an important story. Um, I actually had there was an art magazine. I was I would pour over those, but there was an article on her, it was titled Beauty and the Beast. And about this beautiful woman, and she paints buffalo. And she's leaning up in it, uh, against this tree in the article, and then it says, Nancy Glazier lives in Linden, Utah. And, <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> like my dad, I, I mean, I saw my dad do this so many times. He would approach people he didn't know, but that he knew were in the arts, and just say, I want you to teach my daughter. Can oh, you teach my daughter? I love it. So I went straight to her and uh, asked if, she, if I could take private lessons. And um, first I called her, just a dead cold call, and told her who I was and what I paint and if she could, if I could take lessons from her and, and whatever. And her response was, I'm really busy, you know, I can't, I'm sorry, hang up. And not quite that rude, but pretty close. Pretty abrupt. Yeah, because I understand now, now you being in the see, position yeah. because she's probably on the phone trying to get back to a painting. Right. So about a week goes by, and I cannot shake this feeling I've got to call her back. But because of the phone call didn't go well, I just thought, I don't know how to do this. But I just got very gutsy. I called her back, and um, I said, this is Liz uh, uh, Lemon again. And um, she goes, I'm so glad you called back. Because I felt terrible when you hung up, and I didn't know who you were. I couldn't remember your name. Wow. But the Spirit told me that. I need to be teaching you, so bring your stuff out. So I, <laughs> at that point, I'd been to Utah State. I had my portfolio, pretty sizable one, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go out there. She's going to say, this is great. Here's all you need to do, tweak a <laughs> few things. And, and she's she going to just praise me. She ripped it apart. She ripped it. She, I, she had me lay it out on the floor in her dining room and her living room so she could walk around and look at everything. When she was finished, she goes, okay, these really stink. <laughs> Something to that effect. And I don't remember much after that, except that... Because <laughs> you were crushed. Just, oh, my word. You're like, but my dad put them on the refrigerator. <laughs> and she said, she, um, she said, uh, I'll teach you. And she says, but I want you to know it's going to take you about 15 years before your career takes place and, or establishes. And I'm going, it can't possibly, because I'm really the breadwinner right now. Yeah. And... I've got to support a family and I've got five kids and I'm going to do it differently. I will study so hard. I'm going to do this in a year. And? And she said, no, you won't. And I said, well, am I not that good? I mean, does it, is it going to take longer? She says, it isn't that. It is, it is a matter of life and you have to have enough life and experience enough things that so you that can it put it out. into the paintings. I love that. Because when you hit it so young, you don't have enough life there to sustain it. Which I think if people... Those, Which is in any any area. Right. And I think those that love your work yeah. feel the life. When you look at the faces yeah. of your subjects or the detail, that's life. You know, life has yeah. come out. So did it take 15 years? It took almost to the day. I think there's a book out now that says 10,000 hours. And that's roughly 15 years. Wow. And, and you can't cheat it. It's, you, you might get a little bit of stop and go along the way, but to really get firmly established where it isn't that you sit back, but you're comfortable where you are. Yes. And you feel like you can continue, that this is your mission. 
And I think that's um, such a up. great message for those listening that have someone graduating from college and yeah. starting out. Because I think so often I have a ch I have two kids and one of them has these aspirations. And I think sometimes we just feel like if it doesn't happen now. So what kept you going forward in faith when it was taking so long to take care of your family and balance that motherhood and then pr provide? How did you maneuver that time well and not give up usually with five kids <laughs> my kids in my waterfowl paintings uh and wildlife that my kids have painted on all those canvases but um in the daytime i because i love being a mom it was just i just loved being a mom and i was having a very difficult marriage but i love those kids and so i would spend my day whatever was needed to take care of a home take care of my kids but then at night, I'd put them to bed earlier than they wanted. <laughs> but then I would, I would stay up and paint till probably three or four in the morning, and I did that for years. And and was it you that had a canvas hanging on the wall in a room? Was that you that did that? That in I've the front had room? Canvas hanging. Right, and, but it was in the main area. It wasn't. It was around where you were trying to live, or did you have a studio? Oh, it was no. It was in a home. We lived in a little tiny yeah, home. Yeah. And um, and I think that's important for especially stay-at-home moms that are trying to nurture yeah. a talent or a gift or or a calling or a passion. And they also like me. I feel the same way as a writer and as speaker that my dream was to be a mom too it yeah. wasn't like an either or it was both well it came first yeah and, and because and again this is my dad's influence he loved the gospel and he loved Christ and and that was that overriding thing that was always there I really really knew the importance of being a mom and knew that if I was at in any way neglectful it was going to show up in 20 years mm -hmm. in my kids and and so it was a difficult balance it was a difficult balance but at the same time I loved those middle of the night hours um, where, where I was, I was by myself because the spirit was so powerful I could hear it more clearly and and even though I was painting ducks and buffalo and moose it was there's such a, a spiritual component to creativity Creating. yeah and that's, it doesn't matter that's a God if it's quality, art or, right? Yeah, and, and so I really did feel closer. But I also, those were those were the times when it was so frustrating. I could really, if I needed to cry and get a good cry, no I could. No kids were watching. No kids were watching. So what do so, your kids say now about that time? Have they reflected back what it was yeah, like? Yeah, my son, my oldest son tells a really funny story. Um, he wasn't that old, probably 9 or 10, maybe a little bit older. But he went to a neighbor's house and... Um, he was looking, because I painted in the basement, and he was wandering around their basement. And the mom comes in and says, what are you doing, Steve? And she goes, well, I'm, I'm just looking for your easel. And she goes, I don't have an easel. And he says it was the first time he realized not I every realized everybody's mom doesn't have an easel. I love so. that story. I love that. So have they celebrated that you um, nurtured your dreams and balanced it? It's made them, uh, it's kind of a great thing because all of them, are not afraid to take a risk and follow their dream, follow their conscience. They struggle sometimes. My daughter finished, um, when she finished her, her high school, she, all of her brothers and sisters had gone on to college and uh, were getting their degrees, but she hadn't. It was always such a hard time for her, but they moved to Baltimore. Her husband was pursuing his art degree at MICA. And so she kind of thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something with mine. Anyway, she went back to college at Morgan, which is basically a black university. She, I think she was one of five white individuals there. Oh. Loved it. And then she now is a, an oncology nurse at Johns Hopkins. So, and, and so they're she all like that. She had the like courage that. to do the same thing almost yeah. that you had done. And I see that. I see it in all of them. They've all got these crazy dreams of what they want to do. Um, and they don't feel limited because... I don't think so. I th but again, the same thing that keeps them in their boundaries is the gospel. Yes. So th even though they're dreaming, they are also getting frustrated because it's not going where they yes. want it to. But they're learning and they're just, they believe they can do anything. Well, and I, I often share when people ask about my journey that we have a compensatory God and mm -hmm. he doesn't, 
he knows all the dreams on our hearts. Of course. So if it looks like it's paced differently than you want, um, don't be afraid that means it's died. Right. It's, it may be a season right. where, you know, all of a sudden your family is the glass ball and the rubber ball is your, your other mission or talent right. or whatever. And then it switches sometimes and your family has to be the rubber ball to balance because you're, you're, Art becomes the it's glass It's true, ball. and I think when you're younger and just anxious to get out there and really make your yes. mark, that's when it's the hardest to be patient, and it's hard to realize that you're not in this by yourself. Yes. The Heavenly Father is that partner, and, and there's timing issues. And so sometimes it's come down for me that I couldn't go as fast as I wanted to because of one individual that needed to me to be in a certain place at a certain time that affected their lives. And so there's always this... Um, Have you noticed that then all of a sudden you come back to a project and it's different or better because yes. you did take that pause and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. instead of a setback, it looks like, wait, that yeah. was a setup for success. But I, yeah. if I had been impatient and pushed it, right. I might have finished it, but it wouldn't have turned out and the way My father wouldn't have been able to take yeah. it where it was yeah. supposed to go. What would you say was your breakthrough piece? <sighs> breakthrough piece probably was in Joseph Smith. Okay. I, we had hired a, a public relations first time in the company, uh, Janita Anderson, which was amazing. She worked at the Dinosaur Museum at BYU. So I had worked with her actually in my husband's company. I had taken time off when I remarried and just sort of shopped a lot and, and <laughs> did a few shows and things here for another artist within our company because my husband owned these art galleries. And so I got to know Janita in putting a show together for another artist. Anyway, I was so impressed with her that we hired her to come and do the PR. And she was amazing because she took this dream that I, I had of painting Joseph Smith and had really just not gone anywhere. And she, she, she was like my dad. You only get things done is if you'll go do it. Yeah. You know, don't be afraid to try it because the worst they can do is say no and slam the door in Yeah, your face. R risk. I, I have the same stories of like, if yeah. I hadn't made that phone call. Exactly. And she she made the call. She started she started this ball rolling, but she got this article in the um, Daily Herald, Herald. in yeah. Provo. And, um, Shout out to Daily Herald. I have a yeah. column with them. So. I love them. <laughs> anyway, so on Sunday, there was this huge feature article. It was like three or four pages on... Joseph Smith and that I was painting his life and it was amazing because come Monday morning we just had a gazillion calls coming into the gallery I want to get on the list to buy the originals and that's really when it took off okay and I was able to trans or transform from there that's the wrong word um, transition transition yes to go from there to Christ because I'd established the name is Joseph Smith but I was really only within the LDS community, yes. and so with Christ, now it's global. had to go worldwide, yes. and so it, we kind of bumped up against it too, just in the fact because I was Mormon, some doors got slammed, um, but then, but then the the reputation was, it it was good. I protected it, and I was able to take that desire and then to paint Christ, take it worldwide. So my other, I, I we could talk for hours about every single one of your paintings. Personally, I, I tried to narrow down to two that I'd like to maybe share with our viewers okay. some behind the scenes. The one that um, is feeling really personal to me right now, there's two of them. And so selfishly, since I'm interviewing, I get to ch choose which ones. <laughs> okay. um, Joseph and Liberty Joe. Mm -hmm. um, I, I happen to know the, the model for, cool. for Joseph, and I've been to Liberty Joe, and um, your work is there as well. Um, but through a personal struggle, I when I look at his face in that moment of prayer and I see the agony and pleading, you know, where are you, God? Like, mm -hmm. why have you left me here? Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, actually, yeah, it was one that the um, state of Missouri had asked to create a body of work that could go in the Capitol. For a period of time in the summer, and which that is miraculous, summary, don't you? Which think? is amazing. I mean, really, right there. <laughs> but for the whole purpose of that was that the the governor, uh, uh, governor Hannah, oh, what was his name? He was the one that was killed in the plane crash. Anyway, um, he had invited us to do this, and so there was going to be a display in the Capitol, and then he was going to officially Carnahan. He was going to officially rescind the 
the order against the Mormons, to have the Mormons executed, the extermination order. Anyway, so it was such an honor, and I, he said, I just want you to paint something that is, um, that's the story of the Mormons at that time. Right. So I painted Emma Crossing the Ice and Joseph Which in the Jail. Which is also one of my favorites. Right, and it was, there was, it was such a great thing. Elder Pennick was a dear friend at the time, and um, I had called and asked him, for some help getting into the Liberty Jail, like maybe we could go in at night or something. But he closed the jail so I could actually go in and take a day to shoot there. And we did, and it took a long time because Cliff was so, he is so He's in the, tune with the spirit. Cliff is the model of Joseph. Right, and in fact, I'll tell you a little story about that too. But um, anyway, it took a, a fair amount of time, a couple of hours, for him to really get to the point where where the inspiration, and that's the thing, if, if anything you learn in this business or anything else that Heavenly Father is trying to teach us is patience. patience. Just wait on him because he's not left you. And, and he's going to come through, but you have, I there has that. to be things in place. That, right? So with this shoe, um, jo or Cliff is really trying to uh, hold that character of Joseph in the jail. At one point, somebody on t the way the Liberty Jail is set up, the, they've recreated it there. There's actually a trap door at the ceiling. Yes, like and you can was. see the cross section of right. it. Right, mm -hmm. and so someone up there lifted it up to put more light on him, and and Cliff went completely, completely <laughs> into, into Joseph's. <laughs> and this shaft of light coming down, and Cliff kneeling there as Joseph Smith, and tears just going down his face. It was really amazing. So. And and I shared with you, we knew Cliff um, right before we were going to serve a Navi mission, and my son was actually auditioning to be a part in the pageant, and he came and, and talked to him about Joseph and, and his feelings about that. And I think that comes through, that your models have a very spiritual and yeah. directed experience when they sit for you, so I love that. Um, and, and our time is running, but I want to also talk of your Africa trip yeah. and the... Picture of the Savior. Um, our viewers know my son is in Zimbabwe on a mission. And Ugh. so the minute he got his call, that was the little print. I bought him a little, you know, five by so. seven postcard and, and gave it to him. Um, I, I have been in so many homes that are not LDS, and that painting is, is displayed in so many LDS homes. Right. Can you share some, maybe something about, I've read a lot about that painting and your experience with Mothers Without Borders and, and, and seeing, was his name Kennedy or what was the boy's Little boy name? was Kennedy. He's Kennedy. 16 now. Yeah. And seeing him, but anything you want to share about that painting and specifically oh, Christ in that moment for me feels so authentic. Yeah. And I think Christ I think if you're an artist and you dare to paint the Savior, right? It's a, it that's a trap door. That's a right? whole other interview <laughs> yes. right there. That's a whole other interview because everyone has a very yeah. passionate personal experience yeah. and feeling about who the Savior is and what he might look like. But right. for some reason, that painting just feels like it captured the spirit of what I feel about the Savior. So, um, yeah, it well, it does me too. Even now, I. Um, <clears throat> I was approached by Mothers Without Borders to actually go to Africa and create a painting, <clears throat> excuse me, that could teach, I think those were the words they a used, principle. that could teach these children that the Savior loved them because what they were finding when they got there is that Africa's been ravaged by, by the AIDS and tuberculosis and poverty there that it's taken the parents out of the picture. So these kids are raising kids, or yes. grandmothers are raising kids. Yes. And, and it's just, it's such a, such a culture shock to go there. But anyway, they wanted a painting that would convey to these kids that the Savior loves them because they would go and take these pictures with the Savior and he'd be with white kids. Yeah. And, and there, you can't relate to that. That's not yeah. you. You don't so see your story. You don't see your story there. You're left out of that picture. Yeah. Yeah. So they ask if I would do that. Kathy Headley is the head of yes. mothers and she's amazing and she's insightful and very in tune with the spirit. And so I was very polite in my response because I, that's the last place on earth I wanted to you go. You were not desiring I, that. Experience. I didn't want to go. I, I'm not a real big traveler to start with. And for me, Africa represented fear yes. because of the disease there and um anyway so that was in uh 2007 uh we went but in 2006 is when they approached and my model uh that i was using at the time 
uh, couldn't go, so I actually called his understudy and asked if he could do it, and hoping that he couldn't. And he said, I'd love to do it. Can, can I take my boys? <laughs> Did you guys catch that? <laughs> hoping that he couldn't do it, and then you'd have an out. <laughs> yeah, and he, he said, I'd love to do it. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, well, tell me about your hair. How long is your hair now? Because we hadn't filmed in about six months. And he said, well, I just barely cut it short, missionary oh. cut. And I'm going, oh, that's too bad. Yes. <laughs> Another out. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm just not supposed to go. Anyway, and so come 2007 in July, I'm on a plane headed to Zambia. Because Philip had grown his hair out. Uh, he was my second model for Christ. My first model had stepped out of the project. And we we're headed to Africa. And it was to watch him get off the plane in Africa and everywhere he went, even without the robes on, the people would part like the Red Sea and just stare at the guy. I love that. And and when we were what walking through... What a great through, witness for you that you were heading well, in the right really direction. Well, it really did, but it wasn't. It still wasn't enough. It wasn't until we were on our second day of filming. It's a windy day. It's cold because it's winter down there in July. Yes. Cold meaning 70 yes. degrees. Yes. But it's cold there, and, and he's... Philip is sick. I mean, he's really physically sick, which is another interview. But he's sick, and I'm thinking he hasn't been drinking enough water. Because when you travel, yes. particularly you get internationally, so you have got yes. to drink water. Right. And I thought, he didn't know that. He'd not been abroad. He hasn't drink, hadn't had his water. So I'm thinking, we've got to get the shot. We've got to get him out of here. Get him back to the hostel. Get him to bed. And anyway, so I'm feeling anxious anyway. It isn't going well. Uh, Philip's carrying this little three-year-old around with him, and little three-year-old can't speak English and and I, and I can see he's fading and anyway I'm standing there at one point Philip is holding Kennedy and I'm just praying like Heavenly Father why on earth am I here this is not where I want to be I am I'm not a willing servant I'm not the artist that should have come here because I'm not gonna get what you want my attitude stinks I hate it here it's it's just <sighs> The poverty is overwhelming. It I is could overwhelming. Not, I couldn't get past that. And anyway, and at that moment, I and I said, my father, what is it you want me to do? What am I supposed to capture here? At that moment, I look up. My photographer is doing this power wind on Philip, and Philip is kissing the back of the head of Kennedy, and Kennedy is staring right through me. And I'm just, it's like, as if you were talking to me, you're here for this. Because Africa cannot be healed until they accept Christ. Neither can the world be healed until they they do. So, anyway, it was like this massive revelation just poured. So, I love that. I love, I love, I love your honesty. Mm. I love that so often the most miraculous um, experiences of our lives we go into with resistance and yeah. fear. And I love that the Lord takes us right in those moments and gives us just a little bit of light to go forward, right? Yeah. And then um, and then when the heavens part, so to speak, whether it's in Liberty Jail or in Zambia, yeah. right? Yeah. Then, you, then in those moments, that's when I'm like, I will never be afraid again. I will <laughs> always be on the Lord's errand. I will show up for him and be courageous. And then I find myself two weeks again. later, and he's taking me to the next place. It reminds me of us as parents when... When our kids, you know, I had I'm my son at, we were at Utah State at the time, and he and his friend decided they'd break a few windows. They thought that was just great. Yeah, because kids anyway, are kids. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and anyway, the neighbors came to say, he's broken the windows. And so I'm basically pulling him with me to take him back to the neighbor to apologize and make the commitment that he'll make this right. And, and the whole time he's going, he's crying, I don't want to go. I was just doing it because of this. Yes. It reminds me so much of us because sometimes wrestle. Heavenly Father just has to pull us along yeah. until we get to a point where the door opens, the people you broke the window are there and you're and face to you. face with it. And you're going, I broke the window and you're humble and you're ready and Heavenly Father then just, he really does want to just pour it out. But he also knows if it's too soon, it won't go where it's supposed to be. And, and you so can't he meters the it gift for either. Us. Right. And you're no good to him unless he, it really is a refining fire, fire yeah. to serve. And, yes. and so this says, if anything else, if I got to the end of my life and none of these paintings did any good for anybody, they did for me. And it's a pretty, pretty major undertaking for the worth of my soul. So I'm hoping 
that it benefits other people. Which but it, it has. But it has it has continually borne witness to me of the of the divinity of Jesus Christ, of a Heavenly Father, of our talents. And, and to be willing to be led and live a life led by God is, yeah. it takes courage and willingness. And right. and I think that's why you, you would say at the end of your life, if it only blessed you, you could look back and go, I allow God to lead me. Exactly. And, and there's not regret when we do that, right? No, not at all. What, and, are you, what are you working on now? Well, I'm just finishing a second one for Africa, the one over here with the little girl. Oh, it's I a... don't know if anyone can see. Oh, yes, they can. They can see a little right there. Do you see yeah. that in the back? Wow. So I'll finish that in a couple of days, and then I'm working on one. I'm always intrigued with sort of the moments that maybe kind of get passed over in the history, and I always wondered about that glimpse. This, rel this relationship between John the Baptist and Christ. They're related. They're cousins. Right. But we don't know if there's any interaction before now because as you read you're not sure if john the baptist has ever met him but he does say you know why am i baptizing you why aren't you baptizing me but i wanted that exact moment when he walked into the water and he was kind of and astonished. they were there and and what was going to take place and the spirit completely overwhelming both of them well not christ because it's already there but john the baptist i wanted that total submission it's so all of us, when we get to that moment, when we accept him and, and we and, know who he and is. And once again, are we willing to step into the roles asked yeah. when we feel completely inadequate, yeah. which we do as parents, as mothers, as artists, as writers, as whatever it is that missionaries, right? That, yeah. w that if the Lord is, I always say, willing to push us to our comfort zone and a step beyond, but we're not going to fall off the cliff. It feels that way, right? And I'm sure John the Baptist was like, could feel all of that, right? The awe. Yeah. And the overwhelm. Well, and he he had to live close to the spirit, yeah. obviously, the way he wrote, that he was raised, so he knew of Christ. And just just that moment, and the moment when we're going to meet Christ. What yes. are we going to? What's going to be going through our minds when we realize the whole the whole picture, where the whole picture is given to us of what's going on? Will we fall on our knees in total awe. Absolutely. Will we feel? You know, I think the thing is, is will we feel as as the as Kennedy is depicted, will we just feel that love and acceptance? I think that yeah. is going to be the overwhelming feeling we feel, and yet so often we we're afraid we're going to be afraid, or that we're going to feel judgment. And I and I just right. know that the Savior leads with love, right? Well, and we live so much of our lives afraid, afraid. or or we hesitate to go into the dark to find the light, the light switch. And I think Heavenly Father loves working with. Those of us who feel totally unqualified and inadequate and not capable because he's able to, because that's where humility's found. Right, because if you think you've got it figured out, he can't really tell you to turn left if you've decided exactly. you're already going straight. Exactly. If you're straight. running this on your own, Forget about it. there's no place for him. Yeah, yeah. And so you're going to do that. very spiritless kinds of things. And it's evident by your body of work that you have been a willing instrument. And I thank you and honor you today for thank your you. courage and your mission and the blessing that it has been to Maybe you won't know until the next life. Maybe Probably you'll <laughs> you'll see the enormity of the impact of your work. Where can people find you? And where's the best <laughs> website or store or where? They're where? all over the internet. Okay. I think my husband went on one day and he said there were 64. I think there is. If you hits. Google Liz Lemon Swindle, you will find it. You'll her. find it, but. Probably the biggest representation is LDS.art or okay. LDSart.com. Yes, LDSart.com. Right. And we look forward to more amazing works from you. And thank, thank you. you for your generosity of time and spirit and honesty. And thank you, all of you that have joined us today. Please share this with um, anyone. I, I don't know if there's a conversation that I have felt more um, directed that it is a message for all of God's children to have courage to be directed and to have patience. And if you do that, and the end of your life, you will, you will come to know that your life was of meaning. And so. just remember, you're not, you are never alone, never alone. ever. And the talents were given to you by him and, and he's right there. He'll so have the you. courage to make the phone call, have the right? courage to make the phone call. Thank yeah. you. Even. And we'll see you next week at uh, the same time. Women of worth Wednesday. Thank you so much. Thank you.